Our scripture reading this morning comes from Psalms chapter 23, uh, a little bit different from in our order of service. If you would, go ahead and follow along. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You may be seated. Let's go before the Lord in prayer again this morning. Father in heaven, we've been reminded this morning uh, of your goodness, of your blessing upon this church here in Milton, Georgia. It's a, it's a pleasure, it's a gift, it's a stewardship that you have given us to be part of this body of believers And as we come before you now and we prepare to hear from your word in the book of Psalms, we ask that you would open our hearts, our minds, our souls wide open to the truths of your word. Help us to remove any presuppositions, assumptions, just things that the culture, that the world, that even experience has told us about the Bible. Help us to set those things aside and even let your words teach us anew this morning that you would frame our hearts and minds and that our understanding of not only Psalm 23 but of the rest of the Bible would come from you, that it would be true in our hearts, that it would be an anchor that we can rely on because we know there, were, there will certainly come a day uh, for each of us in our own lives, if not even for this church, which has already gone through many hurdles and obstacles. There will come a day when earthly gifts and assurances fade, even when friendships fade, and the only thing we have left as our comfort and as our guide is your word. And we know that your word is enough. But even now, in the midst of plenty, in the midst of great thanksgiving, uh, would you remind us, oppress upon us the value of the word that God gave to mankind, that we might know you and know you um, in every measure that you meant for us to know you. Be with us now, teach us through these words for your sake. We pray all of this in your name, amen. Well, we're in Psalm 23 this morning. Um, I am not Nathan. He is here, gratefully, uh, but his voice is not quite back to 100%. Uh, So we're not in Mark. We're in the Old Testament in the book of Psalms. So if you're not already there, I invite you to open your Bibles uh, to Psalm chapter 23. So there are two kinds of people in the world those who started playing Christmas music four days ago, and the rest of us who waited because we're right. (laughs) And when I mean wait, I mean I wait till the day after Thanksgiving. That's how long we have to wait. But if you're anything like me, most years the holiday season feels more like a roller coaster ride that you're strapped into than a thoughtful walk through a park or a museum your brain just kind of shifts into fifth gear about two weeks from now, and you're just going, 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 and then somewhere around the second week of January or beginning of February, you're like, what happened? It came and went again. We're not very good at taking intentional reflection over the gifts around us over God's blessings, and really practicing spiritual gratitude. I think that's part of why God gave us the Sabbath in the first place. He knew we need to rest, we need to take a break, and he knew we're not very good at it. We don't like to slow down, 
and the holiday season, even though we all know better, uh, it's not really any different from us, for us. We pack our schedules full of dinners, parties, other activities, while allowing, allowing little to no time for the kind of thoughtful reflection and peaceful quiet that helps us bring our hearts along for the ride. This morning, we're going to look at a passage that has been working on my own heart over the last year, and I think it can actually help us prepare for the holiday season because it has the ability to help stir our affections for Jesus. And when our affections are stirred for our Savior, the holidays become more of what God wants them to be in our lives, a focused season of hope, of love, of peace, of unity, and of joy in the glory of our good God together. Let's turn our attention to Psalm 23, uh, beginning in verses 1 and 2. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. We'll have just a handful of brief points this morning, and the first one is simple. In verses 1 and 2, we see the shepherd provides in the fields. The shepherd provides in the fields. And right off the bat, we see David making two clear statements. At first glance, they seem to be unrelated. What does our shepherd Lord have to do with our human wants? Actually, everything. I mean, the idea that Jesus is our Lord and shepherd tells us just as much about him and how we relate to him as the shepherd as it tells us about ourselves and how we understand ourselves as the sheep in this passage. And we can't skip past verse 1 because it actually gives us the main point of the whole chapter. It's just a few verses, but right in verse 1 we see the whole point. David says two things. The Lord is my shepherd, period, and I shall not want, period. Those frame the whole chapter. So if you're a Christian, God is your guide and provider. He's your guide and provider. That's the main point. We'll work through a few subpoints and implications, but that's the main thing, is that God is our guide and provider. Now, David wants to keep before us that Jesus is our shepherd, and because of that, we don't lack anything. And the psalm is incredibly personal, illustrating this wonderful image of a shepherd who has a loving and tender and close and compassionate relationship with one of his own sheep, particularly David, who is the author here. But we should also note that while the shepherd has a great love for the one, even leaving the other 99 when the one is lost, the shepherd also has great love for the flock as a whole, And throughout this passage, David speaks about his personal relationship with the Lord, but he's also very much echoing God's faithfulness to the people of Israel. David knows he is not the only sheep. Deuteronomy 2.7 is a precursor to Psalm 23.1. Moses says this, For the Lord your God has blessed you in all the work of your hands. He knows you are going through the great wilderness These 40 years, the Lord your God has been with you, and you have lacked nothing. When they were in the wilderness, God gave them manna and water and himself. And the point's not they had manna and water, they had God. They had what they needed. And in verse 2, we see specifically that the Lord is a shepherd who provides for the sheep. And as Christians living in the cultural West in the 21st century, we desperately need the truths of these verses because we are being intentionally suffocated by the wants, dreams, and desires of the world around us. Ours is a culture that does not value patience, has no regard for contentment, loathes self-sacrifice, and idolizes self-promotion. I mean, really, self-exaltation. Our world is all about it. Or to put it another way, our culture is hardwired against godliness, 
against righteousness, against holiness, against humility. And I believe the words of David are meant to both comfort us, but also to arm us for the spiritual fight that is our temporary existence as strangers and aliens on this earth. Picking up again in verse 2, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. If that's not an image of the good life, I don't know what is, right? I mean, that is just picturesque, sounds like a vacation, just peace and rest, green pastures, still waters, which makes sense because there's also a historical undertone here in David's writing of the promised land, the land of hope. Again, in Deuteronomy, there's an idea of a resting place, which refers to the land of promise for God's people. And when the Israelites sin in the wilderness, then they have the 40 years of punishment How does God respond to their sin? He says, this generation shall not enter my rest. But most people today read these verses, and and really what stands out is the green pastures and the still waters. We skip over or ignore the biblical history and go straight to the destination, right? You're thinking palm trees, gentle breeze, but those are actually not the point. The point is that it's God, it's the shepherd, who is bringing David to those things himself. I have to be honest, I was incredibly convicted this week just from verse 2 alone because my first thoughts as I reflect on verse 2 is that, man, a vacation sounds really good. Can I make it to Christmas? Can I make it to Thanksgiving? How much PTO do I have left? What can I, what can I figure out, right? That's not to say the vacations are bad. I'm not saying don't find ways in life to recharge. On the contrary, I think all of those things are gifts from God. Again, the Sabbath being a perfect example. God knows we need rest. But my point is, it's so unfortunate that when I find myself needing a break, I have 10 other things to go to before I go to God. Why is it my first instinct for rest to go to the one who can truly give it? I couldn't lead myself to the pastures, to the still waters if I wanted to. And if I did, it'd be a false idol. It'd be a false vacation. It'd be a false rest because the shepherd would not truly be in it. May God break me, would he break us, of the ways that we pursue and even worship our own methods of rest and help us to find our rest in him. Augustine put it this way. He said, you move us to delight in praising you for you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until we rest in you. We all know you don't find peace or even rest just by having your physical needs met. You can, I mean, we all know we can have everything we literally need provided for and still be incredibly anxious. There's no uh, direct correlation between a quiet life and having peace. There's anxiety, there's strife can come from all sorts of directions. And for David, it's clear the rest here in Psalm 23 comes in part from the green pastures and the still waters, but again, the point is that it is coming from the ever-comforting presence of the shepherd. David isn't made to lie down because of the environment. He's made to lie down because peace, security, and the love of the shepherd are his source of rest. He's made to lie down because of the companion the shepherd that he has with him. One author put it this way. He said, even as David describes the way the Lord ensures that his sheep have grass and water, so he is a provider, it is also clear that the Lord makes the sheep feel safe to lie down and to rest. And as the rest of the passage makes clear, the Lord's protective presence brings about the physiological stability and soul quiet. This frees the sheep from worry about lions or climate. It doesn't matter what else is out there when you have the real rest in the presence of the shepherd. 
And not only does the shepherd provide for our physical needs, but much more importantly for us this morning, he cares for our spiritual needs as well. Looking down at verse 3, he restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Number two this morning is that the shepherd restores us for his name. The Lord restores the soul. Does your soul feel heavy this morning? Does it feel lost? Have you forgotten how it feels to feel spiritually rejuvenated and to actually have a true and meaningful sense of peace in your spirit? The Lord restores the soul. And there's a connection here between verses 2 and 3. But this is where our modern uh, verse and chapter markings can be unhelpful because in in my Bible, it's broken up by a few verses and a few verses and kind of a nice little um, framework there. But verse 3 is as much a part of verse 2 as it is of verse 4, which is where we're going. So in the same way the Lord leads us to rest via the green pastures and the still waters, he's also leading us in paths of righteousness. To be righteous is to be good. It carries the idea of godliness. So David is building this argument that God is leading us in righteousness. And even again here, the point is not even the righteous paths themselves, but on the shepherd who is doing the leading along the path. The paths are righteous because they are the Lord's. They are not righteous without him. And if we look back to verses 1 and 2, of course we could say the Lord leads in in good ways. You've got green pastures, still waters. Those are good ways. But David is setting up a contrast for us, thoughtfully bridging verses 1 through 2 to verse 4. Because if we're honest, when we get to verse 4, we're no longer thinking goodness and righteousness. We quickly forget the idea of the green pastures and the still waters, but the shepherd leads us to the green pastures and to the valley of the shadow of death for his name's sake. The pastures have a purpose. The trials and the valley also have a purpose. We find provision from the Lord in every circumstance because God has declared himself to be a God of provision for his children. And he will not deny himself, which is what it means for his namesake. He will do it because he has said he will, and he is true, and we can trust him. Even in danger, he will undoubtedly provide. Looking at verse 4, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And our third point this morning, we see simply, the shepherd aids us in every danger. The shepherd aids us in every danger. So far, we've seen subtle pieces of the text that help us see that the shepherd who is leading us is more important than the actual circumstances or context we find ourselves in. There's a a subtle shift here in verse 4 from the actions of the shepherd in the first three verses now to the actions of David, saying, even though I walk, I will fear, fear no evil. But it is a subtle shift because the valley of the shadow of death and the fear of evil truly have no power over us because God is with us. I think J.R.R. Tolkien provides a helpful example for us through the epic journey of Frodo Baggins and Samwise Gamgee to destroy the evil ring of power, which feels fitting because those movies always came out during the holidays, so it must have been on my mind. Um, If you've seen the trilogy, The Lord of the Rings, there's no doubt that the main character is Frodo Baggins. He's chosen to carry the burden of the ring. He has the task of destroying it. Um, All of that burden is placed specifically on Frodo, who is a hobbit. And if you haven't seen it, I can't explain it. 
But many people who have seen it will argue uh, and could argue convincingly that actually Samwise Gamgee is the real hero and uh, triumphant of the story because Frodo is consistently making poor decisions. He trusts the enemy more than his friends. He even betrays his friends and goes off by himself with the enemy. I mean, left to himself, Frodo proves in multiple ways that he is quite incapable of the task before him. But Sam, Sam Wise, is steady. Sam is faithful. He will literally carry Frodo to the end. And of course, the illustration falls short in a myriad of ways, but Sam is certainly a picture of the God who faithfully accompanies us through the valley of the shadow of death. Never wavering, Never reconsidering, maybe I shouldn't be here, I should go home. Faithful and resolute, no matter what they are facing. And here specifically for David, we have this idea here that the sheep are walking through this narrow valley, this narrow ravine, and you've got steep cliff walls on either side, so not only is your vision uh, narrowed, it's hindered, you can't see what's over above the ground on either side, so now you've got the enemy can easily come upon you, can easily um, capture you, and just take over um, your awareness without you even being able to think about what's coming and from what direction. And so the sheep going through this valley, through this narrow ravine, have to have help. And not only is our shepherd with us, but we see in verse four that he's equipped to bring us through danger with a rod and a staff. And many have correctly noted this is for the protection of the sheep. We need protection from evil. And certainly our shepherd fights for us and defends us. But they also highlight the fact that the shepherd, while protecting, is also guiding and keeping us from peril. He's protecting. He's also disciplined. He's also disciplining. And he's rescuing us. And we need all three, not just his protection. We need his discipline and we need his rescue. And his rod and his staff show that the valley of the shadow of death is not an accident. He wasn't caught off guard, running after us with nothing in his hands. He was ready and he was prepared to join us in whatever circumstances. And if the contrast between verses two and three with the green pastures and the still waters was not enough, there's an even bigger contrast going into verse five. We've gone from the pastures to the valley, now to a great feast. Verse 5 reads, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Point number four this morning, the shepherd lavishes, anoints, and vindicates his sheep. The shepherd lavishes, anoints, and vindicates his sheep. There are few provisions more important and significant than the provision of food. I mean, it's really unfortunate that our culture has lost a real deep appreciation for food. I think part of the reason we've lost it is because we have such an overabundance of food. We have more food than we know what to do with, really. We have more wonderful food, and we have more cheap and not wonderful food. Uh, Even as I was working on this sermon, I was listening to a conversation at a table next to me about how they refuse to spend money on food that isn't good anymore. (laughs) They're only going to eat the good stuff which is, I've said the same words myself. If we're gonna go out and get some food, like let's make sure it's good food that we're actually going to enjoy. But that is such a modern expectation of food. For so much of the world's existence, food was not a given. I mean, good food was not a given. People didn't know where literally their next meal was going to come from or when it would be, if they would even have more than one meal in a day. And when we think of someone preparing a table for us now, our minds probably go to Thanksgiving or to Christmas, some significant holiday. Yes, it's a lot of work. Yes, it can be very extravagant, but it's also a given. It's just assumed 
that's gonna, it's going to happen. There can be stress, there can be anxiety, but the meal will happen. We just expect it. But the meal in Psalm 23 is a lavish blessing on the sheep that the sheep doesn't deserve is way more than he needs and would ever expect and is also a vindication from his enemies. If you read the book of Psalms, it seems like in almost every other chapter, David is writing about fleeing for his life. He is constantly running from his enemies. And God is now vindicating David by saying, not only do I endorse you, not only am I going to provide this wonderful feast for you that you don't deserve, but I'm also going to do it in the presence of your enemies. I'm going I'm to let them know, no, this, this is my sheep. You are in the wrong. You are the evil ones. It's not just for David to feel good about himself. While they watch, this is how God is going to communicate to his enemies. He's going to tell them with confidence who his children are. And not just for David's sake, but for the sake of God's own name. And we see here, with our shepherd, our enemies truly have no power over us, which when we think about going through the valley, it's easy for us to just have tunnel vision. We're just focused on whatever difficulty, anxiety, whatever inconvenience is before us. All we can see is just frustration with fill-in-the-blank circumstance. But God is giving us the perspective of heaven. He's helping us widen our gaze to take our eyes away from being fixated on our trials and our enemies and to moving them to God's provision and his promise over his people. Even when we only see despair, God is still providing for us. We also see that God anoints our head with oil and our cup overflows. The Hebrew wording here literally says, you make my head fat with oil. I mean, not only have we been anointed, we've been set apart for God, but there's, a, there's an abundance, even an overabundance of oil. It's more than enough oil to do the job, and it shows that the one who gives it is a gracious provider. He is lavishing his blessing on his sheep so that their heads are completely covered in oil and their cups truly overflow. Just as the green pastures, the still waters are satisfying, in David's cup we find that he is wholly satisfied in God's provision. And David is letting us in on a spiritual truism that many Christians, even in the West, tragically miss. We focus on the pastures, on the still waters, even on the feast and on the oil, on the goodness, the mercy, the blessings all of the good things, which are good. And yes, our God is a God who faithfully provides and lavishly blesses us. But it's clear to David, if you were to remove the Lord from this text and keep everything else, there would be no blessing. No peace, no goodness, or mercy. The Lord has not chosen to bless us with prosperity, with wealth, with health, or any other earthly advantage, the Lord has chosen to bless us with himself. First and foremost, it is only in the hand of God that we find blessing, and it cannot come apart from him because he blesses us with himself. And David brings that point home fittingly in verse 6 when he says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And we see in this verse, num number 5, that the shepherd invites us to his house. The shepherd invites us to his house. And in verse 6, we have the fulfillment of David's statement back in verse 1. How is it that goodness and mercy can follow us all the days of our lives? Because the shepherd follows us 
all the days of our lives. And if the shepherd is with us, again, going back to verse one, David can say with confidence, I shall not want. The shepherd is with me in every circumstance. I mean, how is it possible to find yourself in a situation where you don't want? Your needs have to be met. You have to be full with food, satisfied in a job well done. You have to, you have to already have what you could get. I mean, our wants are only taken care of when our needs are taken care of. So another way we can look at verse one is the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not need. I shall not need because we find everything in his presence. And David knows whether in the pastures, whether in the valley, or even in God's house, God has provided for his every need. He can truly be content because the shepherd follows him, which means goodness and mercy follow him all the days of his life. And the word here for follow has the connotations of pursue. So we've got the idea that God is actually pursuing David, pursuing his sheep with goodness and mercy. And again, just to think of it, David spent so many years of his life being pursued by enemies just day and night wondering, will this be the day? Will this be the day? And God says, no, you're not gonna be killed yet, but still fleeing for his life. And the Lord says, you think your enemies can pursue you. I can pursue you. I can pursue you with goodness and with mercy. Even in the valley of the shadow of death, we find a means of God's goodness and his mercy and his steadfast love in our lives. I mean, we work so hard to avoid difficulties. We strive to avoid mere inconveniences. I mean, everything is going great until it's a cold night and your furnace doesn't work. And you're like, oh man, that's a big deal. All it takes is one little thing and we are quickly reminded that we don't have it all together. And we are truly dependent on the Lord and things outside of our control. And even in the valley, we must fully rely on the shepherd. It's just easy for us to rely on ourselves, even in the pastures and the still water. But even in the pastures and still water, we are helpless without having the presence of our shepherd who brings us hope. And one could easily read through these verses and ask the question, okay, But how do we know that we can trust the shepherd? How do we know the shepherd is honest? How do we know the shepherd is good? How do we know that his motives were pure? How do we know the shepherd actually cares about the sheep? And that's because we know on the other side of the New Testament that Jesus came actually to fulfill this passage. We know that Jesus brought himself to be a sheep to be a lamb, and to go before us on the path that he has called us to. Which brings us back to our final point this morning, number six. The great shepherd became the great lamb. The great shepherd became the great lamb. In John chapter 10, Jesus says this. These are his words. I am the good shepherd, I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. Jesus submitted to God the Father. It was the Father's plan for Jesus to come to earth. It was the Father's plan for Jesus to go through the valley of the shadow of death. It was the Father's plan for Jesus to share his last meal in the presence of his enemy who would betray him. It was the Father's plan for Jesus to be a sacrificial lamb for the sins of the flock. Jesus knows what it is to be a sheep. He knows our suffering and he knows our hardships. Hebrews 4 says this, We do not have a high priest 
who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in times of need. Our shepherd is not only the great shepherd, He is our great companion and friend. He doesn't look down on you. He doesn't look down on me as a sheep. He looks lovingly on us as his children. And this is what brings us to the communion table before us this morning. The great shepherd becoming the great lamb. He was perfect, sinless, righteous, holy, God Almighty become human, become lowly, become our sin in order to initiate a divine transaction wherein all of our sin was put on Jesus at the cross and all of his righteousness placed on us through his work by the Holy Spirit. The shepherd has given us so much more than goodness, peace, mercy, Even his own righteousness, he has given us himself. He's held nothing back. He didn't cut corners. He didn't take his time. He didn't give just enough to get the job done. He gave all of himself. In a few moments, we'll begin singing as we get ready to partake from communion together. And as we do that, I want to invite you to reflect on the work of the shepherd on your behalf. Each of us as Christians need to be reminded of his goodness and his mercy which are pursuing us even today. But if you don't know that goodness and mercy, if you don't know the great shepherd, then may I plead with you to repent of your sin and welcome his gracious provision in your life. As we take communion together, uh, as I said, we'll sing in a moment, uh, and then you'll be able to come down forward and grab the elements, the bread, and the juice, and afterwards we will take those together. Uh, This is an ordinance. It's something that God has specifically commanded Christians to do together as a church. So if you've been baptized as a Christian, uh, and if you're a faithful member at a like-minded church or here with us, Uh, You are more than welcome to participate in this meal here today. Uh, But if you're not, I would just ask you again to ponder the sacrifice of Jesus on your behalf and that you would consider surrendering your life in repentance to the great shepherd. Once you take the elements back to your seat, uh, you can return to your place. And then after we finish singing, I'll come back and we will take the elements together. Let's pray now. Father, we come before you, particularly this morning, with this wonderful reminder of Jesus as the great shepherd, the great provider, the one who has restored our souls. And we just confess today, we have other priorities, we have other earthly duties, we have other things that we are just distracted with, Uh, even good things, Father. Father. And just, we can put them in the wrong place. And we ask that you would help us just today, just anew, to reorient our understanding of you, that you would be first and foremost in our lives, and that we would interact with every other person, every other duty, every other activity that we even have to pursue in light of what you have done for us. Help us to recognize and to rejoice in your blessing, but help us to take every, every joy, every moment of goodness and of mercy, and just would we reflect on your great sacrifice. And none of this was for nothing. It is only possible because of what you have done, that Jesus would die such a brutal, awful death for our sake. We didn't deserve it. We didn't want it but we desperately needed it. And so we rejoice in the grace that we have even now today.
because of that work. We come before you because of what Jesus has done on the cross. We hold nothing else in our hands, only his righteousness. And we ask that you would remember his sacrifice and that you would deal with us lovingly as your children because of that. We pray in your name. Amen.